This story happened to me at the beginning of my freshman year of college. It was right after I had moved out of my parents' house. I was one of those kids who just couldn't wait to move out. As a teen, it couldn't come soon enough. I got on great with my parents, but I just really badly wanted to find a place of my own. You know, with my own rules. I wanted to be free to do anything I wanted to, and since they were still willing to pay for college, it made sense to find a place. I found this nice little three-bedroom house in Palatine, Illinois that was being rented by two other community college students. They were sophomores at Harper College, the college I would be attending. It turned out they were looking for someone to fill in the third room. Since I'd be attending the same college as they were, it seemed like a good deal. There was one male and one female roommate, so they added me in and made it like a reverse threes company. Well, my bedroom was at the back of the house on the bottom floor. My male roommate's room was right beside mine, and my female roommate slept upstairs. My roommates kept a much different schedule than I did. They were both full-time students and worked nearly full-time as well. I didn't have to work as a freshman. My parents were paying for everything, and I had scholarships and grants that also helped me pay for my room. Very often, I would have the entire house to myself, and that was just wonderful, although I didn't spend too much time out in the common area of the house, preferring to keep to my own room. Still, it was nice to have a quiet place that was just mine some of the time. Well, one night, after I had been in the house for nearly a month or so, I had gotten very used to having the place all to myself. It was in the middle of September, and I was just trying to settle into my first year of school. My psychology class was having its first test, and I thought I would take advantage of the nice and quiet house to study in. When I got home from class in the late afternoon, to absolutely no one's surprise, the house was completely empty. Grabbing my laptop, I soon retreated to my room so I could study for my test in silence. It ended up that I got so engaged in the subject matter that before I knew it, it was completely dark in the entire house. I was using a flashcard program on my laptop to study with, so the lights around me were all off. Sitting at my desk, I had only the light of the computer screen illuminating the room. When it finally reached around 11 p.m., I realized that I hadn't even eaten yet. I got up and walked into the kitchen to get myself food and a drink. I quickly grabbed myself a sandwich and a can of cherry coke. I turned the kitchen light off and began walking back toward my room. I suddenly stopped though when I thought I heard what sounded like someone talking, even though it was dark in the room. I stopped and tried to listen a bit closer. After a minute or two, I didn't hear anything else, so I figured it must have just been my imagination. Once I got back to my room, I sat down at my desk, going back to my studying. I kept all the lights out because it was easier to focus on the computer screen that way. After about 30 minutes or so, I thought I heard something once again. I cocked my head and tried to listen, wondering what could be getting my attention. I almost called out to see if one of my roommates had returned home, but I knew that couldn't be the case. I would have heard them open the door, as neither of them were ever particularly quiet when they arrived home. When I didn't hear anything, I tried to go back to my studying, but as soon as I did, I heard something once again. I cocked my head and listened even closer. What I heard caused me to go cold inside. I heard a distinct male voice counting. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. I wasn't sure what to do. The voice was obviously not the voice of either of my roommates. It was clearly a much older male voice. It was repeating this repetitive counting over and over again. My first thought was that it had to be that someone had broken into the house. My roommate surely would have told me if anyone else would have access to it. I cocked my head and continued to listen. I just kept hearing that one, two, three, four over and over again, not knowing what was going on. I was certain there must be an intruder somewhere in the house. I decided the best course of action was to make it seem like I wasn't at home. I slowly closed the lid of my laptop and set my desk in darkness. Quietly, I got up and made my way over to my bed, which was against the wall of my roommate's bedroom. 
I quietly curled myself up against the wall, listening through. I could hear that repetitive counting still. Whatever was going on, there was definitely someone other than me in that room. I couldn't assume that I knew why they'd broken in, or even if they knew why I was there. The only thing I could be sure about was that there was someone there, and if they didn't know that I was, I had to keep myself as quiet as possible. I crawled up against the wall and pressed my ear to it so I could continue listening, just in case so I'd know if for any reason that person left the room or would go anywhere else. Laying there against that wall was the most terrifying moment of my entire life. Somebody had broken into the house, and the fact that they were just counting this repetitive sequence over and over again indicated to me that they were not mentally stable. For the first time in my entire life, I was completely aware of my mortality. Nothing could have convinced me I was going to be okay. Well, as I lay there cold, up against the wall, I had completely forgotten about my laptop sitting on the desk. Although I had closed the lid to prevent the lights, I did not turn the volume down, and my laptop was not set to go to sleep. At that moment, a friend's notification echoed loudly in my room. I grimaced, wondering if it was possible that the person in the other room had heard it through the wall. I put my head back to hear. The person was just still counting. At first, I didn't hear anything. Then I began to get up and try to make my way quietly to the computer. At that moment, I heard the counting begin again. I relaxed, assuming the person hadn't heard me. Slowly, I crept over to my laptop, lifted up the screen, muted it, and quietly made my way back to the wall. I wasn't sure how long I stayed there in my room, listening to this person in the other room counting over and over. After a certain period of time coiled up on my bed, I heard the front door of the house open. Someone came in and was rummaging through the house. After hearing this new person open and close the door, I saw it was my roommate. They weren't exactly being very quiet. Right after I made that assumption, I heard the voice of my male roommate who must have come in to call out to me. I got up and ran out of the room. My roommate was standing in his doorway, looking in at his bedroom. The window was open, and the screen had been taken out. All of the drawers were open, and items were strewn all over the place. It was obvious that we had been robbed. Looking at his video playing in a continuous loop on the computer, a guy was working out and counting, over and over again. But we called the police. And this is one of the rare stories where the guy actually got caught soon after. He was found robbing another house a scant few days later. He wasn't as fortunate in this attempt to get away. They found some of my roommate's belongings on him, so he confessed to the robbery. When asked about the exercise video, he said he had heard somebody in the house getting something out of the kitchen. He had started the video to lure me into the room to see what was up. The video was meant to lure me in there and distract me, but I never came into the room. He was about to make his way over to my room, but that's when he heard my roommate's car pull up. He fled the scene soon after. He didn't say why he wanted to distract me, but he was found with a small hatchet on him, and he was arrested immediately after. Due to my good grades getting me scholarships, I was able to afford to have my own room in the dorms. I was in the honors dorm in Douglas Hall, the building that has since been demolished. My room was on the third floor in the third of four wings of the building. It was actually my first dorm room, as I had attended community college for the first two years. It was a bit strange getting used to living such a life, but any college students who lived in the dorms know what I mean. Living at NIU was nearly like living in a small, self-contained city with a student enrollment of over 26,000 and a campus of nearly 1,000 acres. It was a huge and continuously bustling community. The campus rarely quieted down. Students were always up all night partying, studying, or socializing. Although the honors dorm had a mandatory quiet time, it was also right next to the football stadium, which made studying during games rather impossible. If I got up in the middle of the night to just go for a random walk, it was a rare occurrence that I wouldn't just run into anybody. There were generally always students everywhere. Now the reason I bring this up 
is contrast, but I'll get to that in a moment. I was much farther from my parents' house than I'd ever been before. My scholarships paid for my room, but they didn't pay for gas money, and I could only afford one trip back home the fall semester. I had to choose whether this would be during Thanksgiving or Christmas, and I eventually decided on Thanksgiving, so for the five-week winter break, I would be staying in my dorm room. Had I known what the campus was like during winter break, I likely would not have made this choice. By Friday of the last day of class, graphically the entire campus had become deserted. It would be no exaggeration to assume there were likely less than five people left in all four wings of my dormitory. I was also the only person on the floor in my wing, adding to that feeling of isolation. There was a heavy snowfall that we got that year as well, the first week by myself. Still though, having that huge building to myself was fine. I'd occasionally venture out to the liquor store to get a bottle of wine. I'd also occasionally run into one or two other students, who were also sticking around. After that first week though, things began to resemble the movie The Shining. I was staying in the big building all by myself. I never saw anybody, except when I'd go out to the liquor store, and that would be just the cashier. I just about stopped shaving because nobody would be there to see me, and about two weeks into vacation, when I looked in the mirror, I could have sworn I saw Jack Torrance staring back at me. It's weird what your mind can do to you when you spend all your time not only alone, but in such a large area. Two weeks in a row without classes, and my days lost all structure. I stayed up as late as I wanted. I slept as late as I wanted as well. It didn't matter, and it was way too cold to go outside much anyway, other than those frequent liquor store trips. I began talking to myself, but not in a crazy way. I just wanted to hear a voice, or sometimes just actually get to speak. Although I'm not normally very apprehensive walking around in the dorm, it was getting a bit unnerving to me. All the lights in the hallways had been turned off during the break, so as I walked from my room to the bathrooms, the only lights I ever had to go by were from the little water sets and from the bathrooms themselves as well. I would start to see things in the shadows, but I was able to convince myself it was all just my imagination. After I had been in the dorm by myself for about three weeks, I was up one night watching television in my room. It was about 2 a.m., and I was watching the game show network in the dark. Suddenly, there was a knock at my door. Startled, I barely moved. I had no clue why someone would be knocking on my door, not only in this empty building, but also at 2 o'clock in the morning. I thought it must have been the campus police or something. When the knock came again, I got up and looked at the peephole. What I saw was definitely not a campus police officer, nor did it even look like a student. I was a bit older than most of the other students, but the guy outside my door was definitely in his late forties or fifties. He stood there, staring at the door, then knocked again. While I wasn't about to answer to someone I didn't know, and had no idea why or even how he was in the building, I ignored the knocking, and eventually the knocker left. It was entirely possible that he never even knew I was in there, as the dorm room door was very thick. I watched TV with the captions on and tried not to think about it. That is, until the next night, when I was again sitting in bed and again watching the game show network. This time I had been drinking a bottle of Risling and was wondering why Witcher Karma has never been chosen to host the family feud when it happened again. I froze, not knowing what to think. I hadn't forgotten about the previous night's encounter, but I had dismissed it as not being important. Quietly, I got up and made my way over to the door, looking through the peephole. I saw it was the same man as before. He was looking down and knocking on the door. This time, I was a bit frightened. I mean, obviously, I didn't think the man could get into my room or anything. The door was solid and very thick, as these dorm room doors tend to be. I didn't know who he was, though. I also didn't know how he could have gotten into the building, which required a keycard to access nor how he had gotten onto my floor, which required also a completely separate key. This time, the man looked at the peephole, smiled, and told me he could get in whenever he wanted. Then he turned around and left. I didn't know what to make of that. What was going on? 
If anything, I decided not to open my door for any reason at all until people came back. This, however, was realistically impossible, as I did not have a bathroom in my room. I waited for several hours before I just couldn't hold it anymore. I had to go badly, but at that time it was around 4.30 a.m., still pitch dark because it was the end of December. I decided that the man had probably been gone long enough for me to venture out of my room. I quietly left and locked the door behind me. I slipped the key into my pocket of my shorts, then slowly walked down the hallway to the bathroom, trying to be acutely aware of my surroundings as possible. As usual, I deftly made it into the bathroom and decided to use the stall instead of the urinal. I figured the privacy would be much more appreciated at this point. I just tried to relax so I could use the bathroom. The entire time I was in the stall, I heard all sorts of sounds around me. I could hear footsteps in the hallway and people talking as well. I hoped it was just paranoia from the isolation I had been under. You'd be surprised what your mind can convince you of, and if you've been alone for a long enough time. After I was done peeing, I was too scared to even flush the toilet, not just because it would draw attention to me, but if I did, it would be way too loud. The sound would drown out any real noises around me. I promised myself that I would come back when the sun came up and convinced myself it didn't matter anyway since I was the only person on the floor realistically. This meant I was really the only person who had access to the bathroom. Slowly and somewhat apprehensively, I made my way back to my room. As a minor inconvenience, my room was all the way at the end of the hallway, but right across the hall from one of those water closet rooms that were always lit up, so there was a light right outside my door. I walked slowly over to my room, not hearing any noises. It was extremely quiet. As I got back to my door, I darted my eyes around, looking inside the water closet. There was nobody anywhere around, so I took my key out of my pocket and put it into the lock. I slowly turned it and opened the door. As I pushed the door open, the light from the water room behind me suddenly flipped off. I didn't even turn around and look to see who it was. I opened the door and rushed into my room and slammed it shut behind me. I locked it very quickly. After a moment, I turned and looked through the peephole. The man who had been knocking at my door was standing right outside of it. He was looking into the peephole when he said again that he could get in whenever he wanted and smiled at me. He turned around and left. I knew I needed to call the campus police. I tried to catch my breath first though. The man would be long gone definitely before the police got there anyway. If he had come in back then and now through the lobby, there were cameras there that might have caught him on film. I was completely safe in my room, and I knew despite the man's claims, he would not be able to get through that door in any way. When I finally got a hold of myself, I walked over to my desk and lifted the lid of my laptop computer. I searched up the directory so I could call the police. As I opened up my laptop, though... My entire body went numb as I saw a piece of paper taped to my laptop screen. It simply read, whenever I want. At the time, I was 16 and female and attending my first college quarter. Everything was going quite smoothly and I was making plenty of friends until about halfway through the semester. One of my classmates, 26 and male, came up to me and asked to exchange numbers and potentially go out on a date. I tried to make myself clear that I did not want to go out with him simply because he was a lot older than me and I was not interested. I kindly let him down, but he insisted that he give me his number. I continued to tell him no. He took the phone straight out of my hand and added himself as a contact. This startled me but it only got worse from there. The next day in class, we had our regular 10-minute break. I was chatting with my friends when he came up to me mid-conversation asking me to go talk with him. I firmly told him to back off. I'm in the middle of a conversation. He basically gave me the finger and acted like I was the worst person in the world. He stormed down the hallway and kicked open all the doors in his way. I went back into the classroom to at least be with my professor, just in case anything more happened. My friend texted me, asking me what I'd said to him, because he was outside kicking around a trash can and basically screaming at everyone who walked by him. 
At this point, I was too scared to even leave the classroom because I didn't know what he was going to do. I had had a previous stalker at the beginning of the semester and had been in contact with the school about that. I expressed how my classmate was making me uncomfortable at my weekly counseling sessions. The school was well aware. He ended up leaving me alone for about a week or two. Then one day, there was suddenly a note on my desk asking if I loved him, if I wanted to marry him, to have kids with him. He wasn't in the classroom when I saw it, so I just slipped it into my backpack and ignored him for the rest of the lecture. I gave the note to my counselor so she could see that he may be a real issue. I believe she contacted my professor as well to make sure I was safe in class. After the note, we had only about a week left, so jumping to the very last day. I was in an independent study day, and we were all on our own. He came into the class and swiftly got himself kicked out, so he ended up leaving. I felt relieved because I knew that was the last time I would ever see him. At this point, I knew I needed to get my stuff done quickly and make a mad dash to my car. I was about one lecture away from finishing when he walks into the door and sits down at this desk. I knew that I just needed to log off my computer and finish it later. I gathered all my things and thanked the professor. I was speed walking to my car when I had that gut feeling that someone was staring at me. I turned around to make sure it wasn't him. Unfortunately, it was, and he was full on sprinting at me. My first reaction was to call my mom for help. Just as our call connected, he grabbed my arm and pulled me to a stop. At this moment, I was telling him to leave me alone as loud as I can and that I was only 16. He said word for word, age doesn't matter, I know we're in love. I ran to my car as fast as I could to get away from him, but he stayed glued to me. Thankfully, my car only unlocked the driver's side door because he tried to get in as well. From this day on, I've watched my surroundings, and I always have to make sure nobody is following me or watching me. What is up guys, Blue Spooky here as always. Thank you guys so much for watching, especially if you made it this far to the end of the video. If you guys liked the video, please be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you feel so inclined. If you have any comments about what I could do to improve these videos, please be sure to leave them in the comments below as I'm always looking for new ways to improve the channel. Uh, if you would like to contact me on any social media, links to all of them will be in my description below, including links to my Gmail, Twitter, and Facebook accounts. If you decide you want to send in a story for me to read in one of these videos, please be sure to message me on any of those and I'll try to read your story as quickly as possible. If you do decide to send in a story, please be sure to include in the tagline what the name of the story is if it has one, what the theme of the story is if it has one, and how you would like to be credited in the description of the video the story appears in. Uh, please be sure to include proper grammar and try to make it as detailed as you feel comfortable with so I can be sure to include it in a video as soon as possible. Uh, I would also like to give a special thanks to my friend Killer Orange Cat, who allowed me to use his stories in this video. You will find a link to his channel in the description of this video. Please be sure to check him out and give him some support if you like those stories. Uh, last but not least guys, I also have two other channels you can check out if you'd like to. I do uh, disaster documentaries and true crime documentaries on both of them respectively. Uh, that's just some extra thing you can check out if you like my content and maybe it will be for you. Overall though guys, I think that's pretty much it for now. I know I haven't done an outro in a while. I wanted to test and see how the videos without the outros would do. Uh, there's a minute difference, but it's not really big enough to never include them again. So I figure I'll just do some outros every now and then. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching. And I hope you guys have a great day.